Here is a place where land is continually being born and gradually transformed from bare sand into a tall green forest. The process takes about 300 years, almost no time at all in geological terms. The complete transformation is to be seen here, recorded like a diary for anyone to read. This is the story of an ever-changing sand spit called Presque Isle, and of man's disturbing efforts to put an end to that story. The Great Lakes lie along the border between Canada and the United States. They were scoured out by glaciers during the Ice Ages. On the southern coast of Lake Erie, a rock shelf 12 miles long lies 30 feet beneath the waves. The prevailing currents from the west have picked up sand left behind by the glaciers and piled it onto the shelf, thus creating a curved sand spit. For perhaps a thousand years, Presque Isle has been driven eastward along this shelf at an average rate of half a mile each century, or 17 yards a year. Wind and wave have removed sand from its neck, sometimes breaking its connection to the mainland, only to deposit it at the growing eastern tip. But when autumn and winter storms come crashing out of the north, they reshape the tip, hooking it southward. Over the centuries, this process has been repeated many times, building a series of ridges, separated by lagoons or ponds. Upon these narrow strips of land, one of nature's great dramas unfolds, as animals and plants first colonize the beach and then gradually transform bare sand into lush forest. This dynamic process, called succession, begins on the most recent spit of shifting sand, newborn land given up by the lake in the last storm. It is hard to believe that this finger of land is actually growing out of the lake. At first glance, it looks like any other stretch of sandy beach. But a year ago, this was open water. Since then, this new spit of sand has gradually appeared. It happened so slowly that it went almost unnoticed. It is still happening, as it has, year after year, for a thousand years or so. The currents carry sand from farther round the shore, and as the waves lap gently against the beach, the grains are deposited in tiny ridges, one upon the other, so building new land where there was once water. It is a virtual desert, parched in summer, frozen in winter, and scoured by the wind. The surface grains are so clean and dry, and so constantly on the move, that nothing lives here. But even deserts support life, and within months, the first hardy invaders appear. Russian thistle actually thrives in these conditions. It is a plant of sand plain and desert. To fight the desiccating effects of wind and sun, its leaves are fleshy and covered with a thick waxy cuticle. Bands of purple pigment protect its tissues against ultraviolet light, while long roots anchor it firmly in the loose sand. Very few plants can survive here, a dozen pioneer species at most, all carried in as seeds by wind and wave.
In contrast to the others, Seaside Spurge is shallow-rooted and hugs the ground to avoid the wind. Its leaves are small and waxy to minimize evaporation, and its stems are purple like those of the thistle. Successful as they are, these annual herbs and grasses are not permanent residents here, for among them is a species that will cause the sandbar they are living on to change forever. These tiny plants are not ephemeral herbs, but the tough seedlings of the cottonwood, an extraordinary tree with the power to destroy an entire landscape and put another in its place. At this stage, they look more like desert plants than young trees. They have all the adaptations for living in sand. Deep roots, waxy leaves, reddish stems, even the ability to survive being buried alive. The cottonwoods do one thing that few other plants do in the wild. They grow in neat rows, almost as if planted by hand. It is this that gives them the ability to change the landscape. The seeds of cottonwoods will only germinate at the water's edge, and each row marks an earlier margin of the lake. This compact wall of tiny trees acts as a windbreak to the sand, which piles up around them, creating a dune, and spills over into the ponds behind, gradually silting them in. As the years pass, the dunes get higher, and all but the largest ponds become filled. To begin with, the constantly shifting dunes support even fewer species than the sandbars did. But they're soon invaded by a dune specialist. Ammophila, a sand-loving grass, can survive drought and wind and spreads out over the bare dunes by means of runners. But its most telling adaptations are to its roots. As the sand piles up around them, both the mophila and the cottonwoods produce more roots from their buried stems. They branch into finer and finer networks, enveloping the very grains themselves in a tangle of rootlets. In this way, Ammophila and the cottonwoods not only create the dunes, but stabilize them against erosion. In a year or two, the whole face of the dune is covered in vegetation. The surface is shielded from the wind, dead leaves accumulate, and for the first time since this land emerged from the lake five years before, animals move in to feed on the plants. The population is limited by the harsh conditions and the relative lack of food, but the numbers are still sufficient to attract predators. Wolf spiders hunt on the ground. A web would be torn to shreds on the windswept dune. Every detail of this spider's life is a response to its unforgiving habitat, even down to its silken lair in the sand. As we travel towards the middle of Presque Isle, we pass over a progressively older landscape in which the dunes and the sand plains between them are invaded by herbs and grasses responding to the more sheltered conditions. The hairy pacoon could never have survived on the windswept lakeside, but here, in the tangle of meadow-like vegetation, it finds a home. 
It derives its name from the covering of fine silvery hairs on its leaves, a protection against the fierce sun. Pakun is an Indian name for plants whose roots provide pigments for dyeing cloth. These plants, by their very existence, change the conditions in which they live. Many, like the lupin, add more nitrogen to the sand than they take up, and so gradually, year by year, the barren sand is transformed into soil. By the time the land is seven years old, it is sufficiently rich and moist to support shrubs. And in ten years, the seedlings have grown into sturdy bushes, shading out the herbs and grasses of the sand plain, and creating the conditions for a richer and more diverse shrubland community. Frogs and snakes move in, taking advantage of the new opportunities for food and shelter. The shrubland becomes a tangle of vegetation locked in competition for light and space. The cottonwoods by now have developed into a sturdy windbreak, providing shelter for more delicate plants and the insects they support. open areas, prairie grasses flourish, their flowers nodding in the breeze that filters through the protective wall of cottonwoods. Without the cottonwoods to shelter them from the wind, such delicate forms of life would be blown away. web dunes, there were no web-spinning spiders nor flying insects to feed them. But here, such creatures are plentiful, an intricate tracery of life and death. At ground level, the matted stems and grasses provide home and highway for voles, a secretive species that needs a dense cover of vegetation for food and shelter. No creature better symbolizes the richness of the shrubland than the yellow warbler. One of ten or so species of birds that lives in this habitat, the warblers need sturdy bushes or trees to nest in and an abundance of insect life as food for their young. The male warbler sings from the branches of a 40-year-old cottonwood, while below him his territory is under attack. The shrubland is being invaded by a new wave of pioneers, the seedlings of forest trees, cherry, maple and oak. 
It takes over a hundred years for these seedlings to transform the shrubland into a dense stand of mature trees, the climax in the gradual succession of barren lakeside into verdant forest. The canopy is an unbroken patchwork of oak, maple, hemlock and ash, every tree hemmed in by the branches of its neighbours. The dappled light that penetrates the canopy is intercepted by the leaves of understory trees, sassafras, choke cherry and ironwood. So efficient are the successive layers of leaves at catching the light that little penetrates to the forest floor. It is a damp and somber place, a place of thin grasses, ferns and fungi.